And this week's lecture is on networking. And when we say networking, at least for the context of this lecture, we're not talking about uh, connecting with people for work or uh, other such things. Instead, we are talking about how machines connect and communicate with each other. So things like the internet and you know home networks and things like that. And so beginning with a foundation of what exactly defines a network? And that's as simple as any two or more uh, connected devices, whether it be wired or wireless, whether they be local or remote. Any two devices connected and communicating with each other is a network. And then there are some requirements to setting one up. You're going to need both hardware and software, particularly with the, so the hardware side of things. You're going to need a network interface card or a NIC uh, and this contains the fundamental components uh, that are required for devices to communicate with one another. Some networks obviously provide connection to the internet. You guys know this, and this is usually done through an internet service provider, and that in turn requires a subscription service of some kind. Some basic components of a network that enable more robust communication. Uh, the first two to talk about are hubs and switches. And you could think of these as uh, traffic controllers or something like that. Um, I like to think of networks in the context of a road system. And so I like the, the analogy of these being you know, intersections. Uh, where you might have a stop sign or a red light or a traffic director or something like that. Uh, but a hub directs any input that is sent to it to everyone else. So if there are six devices on a, a hub and one device sends out a uh, piece of information, that information gets sent to everyone else. Um, and we call this broadcasting. A switch on the other is a bit more advanced, but has a bit more uh, to facilitate more specific communications. It can uh, receive necessary information to communicate data to only the intended recipient, one or more, and we would call a single recipient uh, unicasting. Multiple recipients is obviously multicasting. Um, a router. It's a device that connects two or more networks, and this is what you may have in your home to connect to the internet. Um, in this case, your home internet is connecting to a wider regional network, which itself is connected to other regional networks, and so on and so forth. A modem is a communication device that opens a communication channel for a device. Um, you don't hear a lot of talk about these as far as home use goes, but they are nonetheless still around. I encourage you to read more about them. Um, these are what can be used to connect to the internet via an ISP. Um, and when you're talking about networks, there's going to be two types in general. We're going to break things down and be a bit more specific in a moment, but in the broadest sense, uh, networks are either home or business. Home networks are obviously very small, usually slow, uh, have much less bandwidth, uh, proportionally speaking, for uploading than downloading. Um, if you've ever noticed on your home internet that you can download things relatively quickly, but anytime you try to post something, it might take a while. Uh, that's usually standard for home networks. Business networks are less the case. They are faster, uh, more expensive, more powerful, and they generally allow for faster uploads. Uh, excuse me for a second. <clears throat> okay, we've basically already covered this. So moving on. Uh, Networks are arranged in different uh, orientations that we call topologies. 
Uh, there's quite a few of these, and I don't want to get too deep into the details of these, because this is something that I personally did, was never even exposed to until I got to a senior level computer science class. Uh, and I know most of you aren't computer science. Most of you don't care. Um, but this is nonetheless interesting information. So the first one is a bus system. And this connects a bunch of devices along a single wire. And that wire is called a bus. These are more common for small networks because if that bus fails, the entire network goes down. Um, ring topologies you don't see very often anymore uh, because you, you, could, you could probably guess just by how they're arranged. Devices are put together in a, in a cyclic format. Uh, and the unfortunate side of this is that if one fails, the entire network fails because anytime say you have six computers and computer number three uh, fails. Well, now two and four can't communicate, two and five, actually two and one may not be able to communicate depending on how the ring topology is set up. So these aren't so common just because they are very easy to completely go down in terms of functionality. Whereas with a bus, it's the wire that has to remain in action. If any of the computers fail, the network is still there. It's still fine. A star network, this is more common for uh, home networks. Uh, your own home internet is probably set up as a star topology. And what that is, is you have a single like common point of communication, such as your router. And that is uh, where everything links up. So if one computer goes down, the uh, network is unaffected. However, if the router or server goes down, then the whole system falls apart. And the last one I want to mention is the mesh network. There are two types of these. You have a partial and full mesh. And you can think of these as being similar to having, having some properties of star and ring topologies in that computers are connected to each other. And what separates a mesh is that these networks, uh, computers are connected to multiple devices. So you may have 10 computers on a mesh network and each computer is connected to three others, or it may be connected to every other computer in the network. And that's what defines a full mesh. Uh, these are very robust, very common for business internet. Um, I could be wrong here, but I believe JSU's um, network, its routers and such are all put together using a mesh network. So what happens if a single part of the mesh fails is now these systems have to reroute. Again, using the uh, road analogy, if one road goes out of service, you're not completely out of luck. You can just find a different uh, route to take. Interstates down, okay, we'll take county roads. Um, and so you'll find mesh networks are very common for that reason. They're very difficult to completely lose. Some network architectures, these differ from topologies in that this is more about what kind of devices are set up and who's communicating with whom. Uh, the first of these is the client server network where everybody's connected to a single uh, central server, and the server handles some of the data processing, the bulk of it, maybe some storage, whereas the clients do a bit lighter work. A peer-to-peer -peer network completely removes the need for a server where everyone is connected to everybody else. Uh, this is common for file sharing services. Um, so more computers means a stronger connection. Um, you may find these also with online gaming uh, and other such things. And finally, cloud computing is where you have a bunch of what we would refer to as dumb terminals. Uh, they don't necessarily do any of the work. Uh, they're just there to present to users. And instead, a bank of remote servers handles all the uh, fine details of what needs to be done, all the storage, the processing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this 
network architecture has become much more popular as uh, servers have become more powerful, storage space continues to increase uh, well into the terabyte range. And it generally cuts down on costs as you have only one central computer handling all the work and a bunch of cheap terminals doing uh, the end user inputs. So let's talk about some of the different network types. There are quite a few to cover. Uh, I'm only going to go over a few, and I want to cover them in order from smallest to largest. The first is a body area network, and this is pretty self-explanatory. It is small, lightweight, uh, is essentially the uh, devices connected, confined to a single body. It might be, you know, medical uh, devices such as a pacemaker or heart monitor or whatever, uh, and your smartphone. Personal area network. These are your own personal devices. They may be connected through Bluetooth or in some cases maybe Wi-Fi. Um, these generally have a range of about 30 feet. It may include your computer, your phone, your game console, and a printer. Things along that line. Next up is a local area network or a LAN, uh, usually confined to a single building, such as a house. Um, these will often consist of a single router and a number of end user devices. Again, same stuff as you would see for a personal area network, just more of it and spread out farther. Uh, one that's not listed here, but I want to mention anyway, is a campus area network, and this connects multiple buildings. You can think of this as a network of LANs, in a sense. Uh, JSU, uh, its internet, is a form of campus area network. This is common for larger businesses as well. Uh, metropolitan area networks connect an entire city or county and may be uh, managed by the government of that particular area. And finally, wide area networks occupy large geographical regions. This may be a state, it could be multiple states, it could be an entire country. Um, and this is the realm of your, um, your ISP, your internet service provider, whether you're using uh, Sparkline or I think it's called Sparkline, I don't remember our network provider's name. Uh, it could be CenturyLink or Comcast or whoever. Um, these are your wide area networks, and it's these that sort of are put together uh, through wireless connections or even by running wires across the ocean, big fiber optic cables to connect multiple countries together uh, that are put together to form the World Wide Web and give it its uh, backbone structure. Uh, I don't want to go too much into detail on all of this because we understand wired and wireless networks, but I would like to explain the difference between internet and intranet. So we've talked about internet being, you know, the global uh, network of communication, whereas an intranet, as you could probably tell by the name, is more of an, a closed off private network, doesn't allow certain uh, unauthorized people in. You might need a password, you might need biometrics, you might need uh, other things along those lines. Whereas an extranet is more open. It allows customers, vendors, or whoever outsiders need access. They're, they're granted that. And um, finally, the, uh, I want to talk about virtual private networks. These are not the same kind of things as what we've been discussing. These are more a secure line through a public or private network. These may uh, allow business employees to connect more securely, send encrypted information, uh, or if you're out using a public network, you can do your usual business through a VPN without having to worry about somebody trying to steal your information. So if you're if you travel a lot um, and need to conduct business on the go, it's highly recommended that you 
get a VPN of some kind. There's plenty of options out there. You've no doubt heard um, sponsorship deals with you know content creators on YouTube or Twitch using like they, they sponsor by uh, Surfshark or Nord VPN. Um, all right, moving on to the next subsection. Uh, before we do, does anybody have any questions? While I take a drink of water. We're good. Outstanding. So, moving on to some threats. We talked about most of these already. Malware, phishing, social engineering. All of this is uh, old hat by this point. But one thing I want to bring to your attention is denial of service. And what this is, is malicious individuals or groups will flood a network with typically garbage data and this can cause service interruptions or even network outages, usually with the end goal of disrupting business for some kind of gain or recognition or what have you. And they may do this using what are called zombies. These are devices that they have compromised either through uh, malware, hacking, or some other means. And they then use all of these uh, compromised devices to send this garbage data. And this might say uh, interrupt Amazon service so that they can't sell products and that, you know, damages their ability to continue as a business. There was a time several years ago where uh, denial of service attacks were very common against the PlayStation Network. I remember hearing all kinds of stories of this. Um, and it, it can be very detrimental because if you think of how many people use something like PSN or Amazon and how much money is generated by this in a day. And it, it's not incredibly out like unheard of for a denial of service attack to interrupt service for that long and when that happens all of that revenue is just gone uh, that it, it, you've lost that for the day and so these are very dangerous attacks uh that do very much happen they can happen to uh home networks they can happen to pretty much anybody uh, but are most commonly used against businesses and other such groups like that like governments when a malicious user wants to get your data directly, uh, they may do so one of two ways. They might find your uh, information out by connecting to the same network as you. Say you're on a public network and you're shopping on Amazon. You've just sent out your uh, credit card information. And here's somebody who's also connected. They're using a program like Wireshark to read packets and they manage to piece together the packets that correspond to your credit card number, and they've just got your information. Another way they might do this is by using an evil twin, and this is similar principle, but what they've done is they've created a clone of a public network to trick people into signing on to it, and now they have more direct access to information that is sent and received. And so this is why you need to be extra careful when you're connected to public networks. Use a VPN, use caution and common sense. Um, and just, you know, protect your information. A few features to protect your own home network. First is authentication. You have strong passwords, network keys, and things like that. Uh, we've talked about strong passwords before. Uh, I know I never sent out the thing that I said I was going to. Um, at the end of this lecture, I will cover some strong password strategies rather than sending out a worksheet. So I apologize that I never got that out to you guys, um, but we're going to cover it today. Um, another way to authenticate users is through biometrics. You may not have access to this through your home network, but this, this is a feature that is available more likely for business networks. There are also firewalls. These can be implemented through hardware or software. And all a firewall does is block unauthorized access from entering. 
Uh, in the event of a threat being detected, the firewall can be locked down, which would then block all access. And lastly, encryption, which we've covered. I'm not going to repeat myself on this today. Uh, devices such as network attached storage. These can be very powerful tools, but may necessitate a bit more uh, security features. Network, act I'm just gonna call it a NAS device. Um, <clears throat> this allows you to store your information remotely. Instead of being directly on your computer, you've got, here's an external drive that um, has everything on it and everyone on the network can access it. And this also gives you the power to, again, encrypt. You can spe uh, specify who is on the network that can view, edit, add, delete files from this drive. And again, having something like this, very powerful, but you should take extra steps to protect it. And this is just talking more about encryption, not going to go over that. Net neutrality is something I don't want to spend too much time on. This is a very complex issue that I don't want to try and boil down into a couple of minutes. I very much encourage you to read about this. It is a, a hot button issue, has been for several years. Um, I personally am a strong proponent of net neutrality. Uh, I encourage you to read up, form your own opinions and generally just be informed about this sort of thing because this is, it seems like it's been in a constant, you know, legal limbo despite any laws that get passed for quite some time now. And moving on to connecting to different types of networks. Um, there's a lot of specific things with protocols to talk about here that I don't really want to get into detail on because this gets... Uh, quite complex very quickly, and I don't want to overload you guys. And you guys know what uh, Ethernet and uh, Wi-Fi are. You're generally not going to see a lot of power over Ethernet or uh, phone line connections nowadays. <clears throat> LTE, you guys, it's mobile uh, network connection. Don't want to waste too much of your time talking about this. One thing I do want to talk about just in brief, is TCP IP. You're going to see this everywhere. Uh, this is the backbone protocol set of the internet. Um, TCP IP is a multi-layered set of protocols that uh, explain how uh, data is sent and received, the way that it is broken down and recomposed as it travels between networks and devices. Um, there are, if I remember correctly, four layers to this, and each of these is just a progressively more fine-grained um, decomposition of data with its own set of uh, needs. And so at the highest levels, you might have uh, entire chunks of recognizable, coherent data, and all the way down at the bottom, you're going to see uh, that it's just a bit stream. And so these, the information gets broken down from one layer to the next. Uh, we call this marshalling. And then once it reaches its destination, it's put back together. And we call this unmarshalling. And something to note about this is that it is an asynchronous process. So um, you might send a Word document uh, across the internet and as it gets broken down, it is not necessarily going to be sent in order. That is very possible, but also very unlikely. So it's, it, you may get a packet containing the last couple of words first, and then the title, then other some other crazy random order. It all just depends on how it gets fed through uh, a sort of first come first serve type of basis. And here's some other uh, uh, short range communication standards. You've got Bluetooth, RFID, uh, NFC, and ERTA. These are, again, very commonly well known, Bluetooth especially. Um, you are more than likely uh, participating in this lecture 
oh, excuse me, you're more than likely participating in this lecture on a Bluetooth capable device. Uh, and all of these have very short ranges, but are generally very fast, which is often the trend. The, the more long range it is, the slower it tends to be. Uh, but something like Bluetooth is very rapid. But at the same time, transmits very small bits of data at a time. Steps to connect to a network. A lot of this is really obvious. Buy the necessary equipment. Um, connect to your ISP. So I don't want to really, I don't want to spend too much time on this. What I do want to focus on is configuring the name and the uh, network key. Your router will likely come with these. You'll have one that's uh, already defined. You should change that. Even if it looks secure, it probably isn't because a lot of providers will give the same key to a bunch of different devices. So you really want to change that, um, give it something unique. Again, strong passwords. We'll cover that in a moment. What is this? Sorry, I, I'm a little bit scatterbrained today. Oh, mobile hotspots. You guys have seen these before. This is uh, essentially turning a device into a uh, a Wi-Fi connection. Uh, your phone more than likely has this feature, but enabling it will cost you more money for, from your uh, phone service. But this is an option if you need Wi-Fi access on the go. And the last thing we're talk we want to talk about is securing. Again, change the default usernames and passwords for your uh, your router and modem or whatever. Um, and do these things regularly, maybe like w once or twice a year. You want to change your passwords. Um, just in case somebody has gained access to them. You might also want to view uh, what kind of connections have been made. Um, also enabling and configuring MAC address control features. MAC addresses do not have anything to do with Apple computers innately. Um, in this context, a MAC address is a uh, numeric identification that is used to uh, identify network enabled devices. So your network interface card has a MAC address. Uh, your printer might have a MAC address. And MAC addresses are used to communicate within a network and know who is being given this information. When communicating between networks, that's when your IP address uh, comes into play. And lastly, regularly perform updates. Make sure that you have the latest firmware for your router. Uh, these updates are intended to help keep your information secure. And so that's going to wrap us up for this lecture. Um, two things before we close out for the day um, is I want to, again, go over what strong passwords look like. For those who don't know, those who haven't been, had this explained to them yet. Um, so let me bring up Notepad, just regular old Notepad. I don't remember what was opened in Notepad++. Uh-oh, my mouse is misbehaving. All right, let me drag this more into a centered view. So a common mistake that people make is having some kind of sequence or a name or something like that. Uh, something like Birdie UIOP. Uh, it could be five, six, seven, eight. Uh, see one, two, three. These are all among the most common passwords that people use, and these are extremely dangerous to be using. You're more or less opening yourself up to some kind of uh, dictionary attack or other brute force method because anyone trying to crack your password is going to more than likely start with these and maximize their chances. Something else you might not want to do, 
um, is have recognizable words in your um, password. So I don't mind pointing this one out. One that my folks used to use, they don't anymore, thankfully, is one, two, three, four, love. Obviously, this is another terrible password. Again, recognizable sequence and a dictionary word. It would take no time at all for someone to crack this password. So how instead do we go about making a password that doesn't suck? Uh, a few things to note is you want to use uppercase, lowercase letters, numbers, and symbols, such as dots, dashes, underscores, things like that. Whatever the um, service uh, for that account will allow. They'll allow different things. They may allow ampersands or percent signs, dollar signs, but usually you're going to see dots, dashes, and underscores uh, in most cases. So you want to include things like that. Uh, you want to avoid any recognizable sequence. It wants You want it to look random to anybody but yourself. So say you wanted to make a password for um, Amazon. You especially need that to be secure because that's going to have credit card information stored on it. Um, as far as length goes, the bare minimum would be eight characters. But you would you would really want to go for 15 to 20. 16, I feel, is a good uh, middle ground where the password is long enough to be difficult to crack, but not so long as to be difficult to remember. And on that point, uh, if you're going to write your password down, make sure it's stored somewhere secure. So maybe like a small safe or um, a firebox or something like that. Somewhere where somebody can't just walk in and uh, see it, as that's a hazard in and of itself. So let's take a look at what would be a good example of a strong password. Uh, you can build it from fragments of information. So say you might start with the day of the week you were born on. I don't remember mine. I want to say Friday. So let's just start with an uppercase F. Uh, the day for me would be 25. Let's uh, go with a two from that. Uh, pick. You might then pick a number from your zip code or your favorite number. Let's just let's do something like that. I don't necessarily have a favorite number, but let's just go with seven, and then throw in a dash. Uh, you might then go with your a letter from your last name. I and do do things like this. Um, Take a set of numbers that uh, you can easily remember, that you have some device for, like for me, 8472.bh, uh, initials for a band that I like. And, you know, just keep doing stuff like this until you're satisfied with your password. This is one, two, three, four. Uh, that's five. Letters 9, 10, 11, 12. 12, that's a good, uh, a bit short, uh, but definitely a strong password here. We've got a little bit of everything going on. Um, and so that might be an example of a strong password. Uh, and again, as always, make sure that your password is not used anywhere else. Make sure that it is unique to uh, that particular account. And so let's close out of this.